Welcome to lecture 27 of Electrical Circuits 1. First this lecture, I want to review our voltage current relationships for resistors, capacitors, and inductors that we presented last time. After that, I want to introduce topics called impedance and admittance. It turns out that these voltage current relationships are very readily put into a common form by introducing these ideas. After we do that, we'll do some analysis examples of steady state sinusoidal excitations of circuits. Most of the lecture will be spent doing examples. Related written materials are in sections 2.7.3 and 2.7.4. In the last lecture, we developed the voltage current relationships for the phasers for resistors, inductors, and capacitors. I want to briefly summarize those here. If I have a resistor with a voltage phasor V sub R, remember the underscore denotes a phasor for us, and a current I sub R, the voltage current relationship is that V sub R as a phasor is the resistance times I sub R as a phasor. Now this is a purely algebraic relationship. Keep that in mind. Resistors are unique in that the scaling between voltage and current is a purely real number. Since this number is real, the voltage and current phasors have no phase shift one relative to the other. Voltage is in the same direction as current. It is simply scaled by the value of the resistance. Inductors. If I have an inductor with voltage V sub L in phasor form across it and current I sub L in phasor form through it, I can represent the voltage current relationship as V sub L is equal to J omega L times I sub L. Now what I've done on my diagrams here is in place of R, I've put the scaling factor J omega L between the voltage phasor and the current phasor here next to the diagram. We'll see why I did that in a moment. The relationship between voltage and current in phasor form across an inductor has a J in front of it. This is a purely imaginary number. That means that voltage and current are 90 degrees out of phase from one another. And in fact, the voltage across an inductor leads the current through the inductor by 90 degrees. Another way to state that is that current lags voltage by 90 degrees. Finally, for capacitors. If I have a voltage V sub C across a capacitor and a current I sub C through a capacitor, the voltage current relationship in the phasor domain is that V sub C is 1 over J omega C times I sub C. Again, I've put the scaling factor between voltage and current up here next to the capacitor symbol for reasons that will become apparent shortly. Notice that again, I have a J here. If we take this J into the numerator, I get V sub C is minus J times 1 over omega C times I sub C. Again, I'm multiplying it by square root of negative 1, except that there's a negative sign associated with it. That still gives me a 90 degree phase shift between voltage and current, except that the phase shift is in the opposite direction. Voltage for a capacitor lags current by 90 degrees, or alternatively, you can say that current leads voltage by 90 degrees for a capacitor. Now I want to introduce two additional concepts, impedance and admittance. Impedance is defined as the ratio of the voltage phasor across a circuit element to the current phasor going through the circuit element. Notice that this only has meaning in the context of steady state sinusoidal analysis. Now if I multiply through by the current phasor, I can rewrite this as the voltage phasor is equal to the current phasor times Z. This is the same form as I wrote on the previous slide, all of my voltage current relationships for resistors, capacitors, and inductors. This is nice because it allows us to deal with capacitors and inductors in a steady state sinusoidal sense the same way we dealt with resistors in the time domain. Okay, the voltage is the current times something. Now the something just becomes potentially a complex number. I want to make a few comments about this. As I've said already, impedance defines the relationship between the voltage and current phasors. This is only good for steady state sinusoidal analysis. These are in the same form as Ohm's law. If you look at our time domain stuff, voltage was equal to I times R. Those could be functions of time. Now V is equal to I times Z, where voltage and current are phasors. Since this is identical in form to Ohm's law, the units of impedance are taken to be ohms. I want to emphasize a couple of additional things about impedance. 
Impedance is a complex number. I can write impedance as a real part plus J times an imaginary part. R is called the resistance. If the impedance is purely real, X is zero, Z is just equal to R, we recover our case for resistors. We recover Ohm's law out of this. X is called the reactance. It's essentially the imaginary part of the resistance. Impedance is not a phaser. Remember that by definition, phasers are describing a sinusoidal waveform. There is no sinusoid that's associated with this. Okay, it's a complex number. A phaser is also a complex number, but it's describing an underlying sinusoid. I want to very quickly redefine our voltage current relationships for resistors, inductors, and capacitors in terms of impedances. This should be easy because we've already presented it that way. If I look at the voltage phasor across a resistor relative to the current phasor going through a resistor, I can label the impedance of this device as Z sub R, where Z sub R is just the resistance of the resistor. If I'm looking at an inductor, I have a voltage phasor across the inductor, current phasor through the inductor. This has some impedance Z sub L, where according to our previous relationships, Z sub L is just J omega times L. If I look at my voltage phasor across a capacitor relative to the current phasor through a capacitor, I can list the capacitor impedance as Z sub C, where now Z sub C is just equal to 1 over J omega C. Now all of our voltage current relationships look like V is equal to I times Z. V is equal to I times Z. V is equal to I times Z. The other parameter that I want to introduce now is called admittance. Admittance is sort of the corollary to conductance for a resistor. So admittance is just the inverse of impedance. Admittance is also a complex number. It's generally written as G plus J times B. G is what is called the conductance. So if the admittance is purely real, the G takes the place of our old concept of conductance when we were looking at resistors. B is the susceptance. It is simply the imaginary part of admittance. It turns out that impedance and admittance are extremely useful. The question should be, I guess, why? In general, all of the analysis techniques that we used in the time domain for resistive networks now will be applicable in the frequency domain to phasor circuits. Okay, so all of these guys, KVL, KCL, circuit reduction, nodal analysis, mesh analysis, Thevenin's and Norton's theorems, those all apply to phasor circuits exactly as they applied in the time domain to purely resistive circuits. You noticed when I was talking about time domain first and second order circuits, I didn't use Thevenin and Norton's theorem. I didn't do any circuit reduction. All that kind of stuff kind of got swept under the rug. Now I can bring them back out and apply them almost directly to circuits with energy storage elements in them. In general, and I'll talk about this in more detail for the next two or three slides, to apply these methods you simply substitute impedances where we used resistance earlier and you use phasor voltage and currents in place of the time domain voltage and currents that we were allowed to use for purely resistive networks. Now I want to formalize my discussion, so I'm going to be talking about steady state sinusoidal or equivalently AC analysis methods. KVL and KCL, as I said previously, apply directly to phasor circuits. KVL gets restated as the sum of the voltage phasors around any closed loop is zero. KCL becomes the sum of the current phasors entering a node is zero. Likewise, our circuit reduction methods will apply directly to phasor circuits. So impedances in series and parallel combine exactly the way that resistors in series and parallel combine. Voltage and current divider formulas apply directly to phasor voltage and currents. You simply use impedances in the place of resistances, phasor voltage and currents in place of our earlier time domain voltage and currents. Continuing on to talk about our analysis methods. Nodal analysis and mesh analysis apply to phasor circuits as well. Node voltages and mesh currents become phasors. 
what we used to use for resistances now become impedances. They all can have complex values. Superposition, I want to make a couple of important points here. It applies in the frequency domain. Okay, if you have multiple signals with different frequencies in a circuit, the only thing you can do is superposition. Since the impedances of each circuit element in general, and specifically for capacitors and inductors, their impedances depend upon frequency. Okay, an inductor's impedance is J omega L. A capacitor's impedance is 1 over J omega C. So if you have signals at different frequencies, the impedance will change for those different frequency components. If you're going to analyze them in the frequency domain, you have to analyze each of those frequency components separately. That, of course, isn't true if you're doing a time domain analysis. However, you have to do the summation, okay, when you've done each of the individual cases, when you sum them up to get the overall response, you have to do that in the time domain. Remember, it doesn't make sense to deal with impedances of a single circuit element at two different frequencies. Okay, those impedances are specific for the frequency that you're driving it at. You can't add up those kind of impedances. So analyze them separately, but combine them in the time domain. Thevenin and Norton's theorems apply to phasor circuits. Essentially, your open circuit voltage and your short circuit current are simply replaced by phasors. The analysis method is the same. The Thevenin resistance, RTH, is simply now an impedance, ZTH. So ZTH is the impedance seen by the load, just as RTH was the resistance seen by the load. Now, there is one thing I have to say about maximum power transfer. It doesn't apply exactly as it did for resistive networks. You can analyze it the same way, but in order to provide maximum AC power to a load, your load impedance is the complex conjugate of this Thevenin impedance. So the imaginary parts have to change between this Thevenin impedance and the load impedance. You have to change the sign on the imaginary part to apply maximum power in an AC sense. We'll talk about that topic in more detail when we get to steady state sinusoidal power analysis. Now let's do a couple of examples of using impedance to analyze AC circuits. For this circuit, I want to determine the current, I of t as a function of time and V of t, the voltage across the resistor as a function of time, in steady state if the supply voltage V sub S of t is 100 times cosine of 2500 T volts. Now if I'm going to do impedance domain analyses, I want to transform this into the impedance domain or the frequency domain, so I need to determine the impedance of this resistor and the imp impedance of this capacitor. Resistor's impedances are just their resistance value, so the resistor's impedance is just 10 ohms. I need to determine an impedance of the capacitor. So an a capacitor's impedance is 1 over J omega times C. This is 1 over J times the frequency is 2,500 radians per second times C, which is 50 times 10 to the minus sixth. If I move this J into the numerator, it becomes a minus J. So this becomes a minus J over 2,500 times 50 times 10 to the minus sixth is 0 0.125, which is 1 over 8. So the capacitor's impedance is minus J8 ohms. Now I can use this impedance and do a frequency domain analysis. Let me redraw this circuit in phasor form. My applied voltage has an amplitude of 100 and a phase angle of 0 degrees. So 100 cosine 2500 T becomes 100 at an angle of 0. Remember we've lost track of our frequency information. The 2500 doesn't show up, but it will be used implicitly in this impedance here. We said that the capacitor's impedance is minus J8 ohms. The resistor's impedance is just its resistance, which is 10 ohms. I am looking for the current phasor going out of the source and the voltage phasor 
across the resistance. Now, this voltage phasor looks just like a voltage divider. Remember, all of my circuit reduction formulas apply directly in the phasor domain. So V, as a phasor, is this voltage, 100 at an angle of 0 degrees, times this impedance, which is 10 ohms, over the sum of the two impedances, which is 10 minus J8 ohms. Now I can do some complex arithmetic. This becomes 1,000 at an angle of 0 degrees over 10 minus J8 ohms. Doing that mathematics, this becomes 78 at an angle of 38.66 degrees volts. Now I can use this result to determine this voltage, or I can go back to my original circuit and use that. I'm going to leave this result here, denote that as the voltage phasor because I want to make a point relative to that in a minute. The current phasor, I, even if I didn't have this, all of these circuit elements are in series. Therefore, the current through any of them is the same. So the current out of here is the voltage difference across these over the total impedance. It's an Ohm's law kind of thing. So I is equal to this voltage phasor, 100 at an angle of 0 degrees, over t the total impedance, which is 10 minus J8 ohms. Okay, I is equal to V over Z. If I do this mathematics, I end up with 7.8 at an angle of 38.66 degrees in amps. We're done. I do have one additional thing that I want to point out. This I is the current through this resistor. V is the voltage across this resistor. There should be no phase shift between the resistor's voltage and its current. They should have the same phase angle and they should be scaled directly by the resistance. So the current through the resistor should be one-tenth of the voltage across the resistor. Now, I didn't ask for the voltage and current phasors. I asked for voltage and current as a function of time. I can convert these phasors to the time domain, but I have to remember that my frequency was 2,500 radians per second. So V of T was equal to this amplitude, 78 cosine of 2500T plus 38.66 degrees volts, and I of T is equal to 7.8 cosine of 2500T. Remember, everything here has to have the same frequency, plus 38.66 degrees in amps. Now I'm done with the problem. I could do this problem the same way I did a similar problem in the first third of the course by looking simply at a resistive network. For our second example, let's take a look at this circuit here. We'll first determine the equivalent impedance seen by the source. So looking into these terminals here, we'll combine this network into a single equivalent impedance. We'll then take a look at the current delivered by the source. That will be easy if we have an equivalent impedance because the phasor version of Ohm's law just kicks in. Finally, I can find the current I of T through the capacitor. So once I have this total current here from part B, this now looks like a current divider. Okay, so we're going to use several of our circuit reduction techniques to analyze this circuit here. Why don't you go ahead, take a quick look at trying to do that yourself, then I'll come back and do the problem. The first thing that we want to do is transform this capacitance and this inductance into impedances. We'll also want to take this supply voltage, 5 cosine 3T, and transform that into its phasor form. So transforming this circuit into the frequency domain, my source becomes 5 at an angle of 0 degrees. It's a 5 volt amplitude, 0, volt, zero degree phase shift from a pure cosine. I have a resistor, 
a resistance's impedance is the same as the resistance value. It has an impedance of one ohm. This resistor has an impedance that is the same as its resistance. It has an impedance of three ohms. The impedance of an inductor is J omega times L. So this inductor, Z, is equal to J times omega, which is three, times L, which is one Henry. So I have here a J3 ohm impedance. Three times one is three. The capacitor has an impedance which is one over J omega C. So this impedance, Z sub C, is one over J times omega, which is three times one over nine, which is the capacitance. Three divided by nine is one third. The one third shifts into the numerator. If I move the J into the numerator, I get a negative J. This should come out to be a minus J three ohm impedance. Now we'll move to the next slide, take this circuit as our starting, starting point and determine the equivalent impedance seen at these two terminals. For part A of this problem, we want to determine the impedance seen by the source. If we remove the source from our previous result and replace it with a pair of terminals, what we're doing is finding the equivalent impedance looking into these terminals. We can determine that by essentially our circuit reduction techniques. So let's step by step reduce this circuit to a single impedance. I can combine this series combination of the resistor and the inductor very easily. So the first thing this is going to become, I'm not going to change this resistance. This is a one ohm resistor. I now don't know physically what this circuit element looks like. I'm going to represent it as a little box. However, I know its impedance is the sum of the individual impedance, just as the resistance of a series combination of resistors is the sum of the um, individual resistors. So this is 3 plus J3 ohms. The capacitance still remains. I end up with a minus J3 ohm impedance there. This impedance is now in parallel with this impedance. I can combine this parallel combination the same way I could combine two parallel resistors. It's the product of the impedances divided by the sum of the impedances. This circuit then becomes a one ohm resistor. I'm still not touching that with another impedance in series with that where this is three plus J three ohms times minus J3 ohms over the sum of the two impedances, which is 3 plus J3 ohms minus J3 ohms. I've kind of cooked the numbers on this example so that this J3 cancels with that one. So this impedance becomes a minus J3 times 3, which is a minus J9 ohms. Minus J times J is negative of negative 1, which is plus 9 ohms, divided by 3, which is minus J3 plus 3 ohms. Now, I have a 1 ohm resistor in series with an, an equivalent circuit element with an impedance of 3 minus J3 ohms. If they're in series, I can just sum the individual impedances, so I get a single equivalent circuit element which has an impedance of 1 ohm plus 3 minus J3 ohms. That goes there, which becomes 4 minus J3 ohms. That's the equivalent impedance seen by this source. In the next part of this example, I want to determine the current delivered by the source. And what I'm going to do is use my previous result. If I replace my network with its equivalent impedance and replace the source across that equivalent impedance, the current out of the source is simply the voltage divided by the impedance, by definition of the impedance. So for this particular example, I sub S as a phaser is equal to the voltage difference, which is 5 at an angle of 0 degrees over this impedance, 
4 minus j3 ohms. Now I'll go ahead and put an intermediate mathematical step in here to make sure that you're getting comfortable with complex arithmetic. When I have a ratio of two complex numbers, I generally find that that's easier done in polar coordinates than in rectangular coordinates. So I'm going to take my denominator and convert it to polar coordinates. So this is 5 at an angle of 0 degrees over the magnitude is the square root of the sum of the squares of the real part and the imaginary part. So this is the square root of 4 squared plus 3 squared. And it has a phase angle, which is the arc tangent, so the inverse tangent of the imaginary part, which is minus 3 over the real part, which is 4. Now I'll go ahead and just evaluate this. So this is 5 at an angle of 0 degrees over, let's see, this is 16 plus 9, which is 25. Square root of 25 is 5. This is arc tan of minus 3 over 4, which my crib sheet tells me is minus 36.9 degrees. Now when I'm dividing two complex numbers in polar form, I divide the amplitude. So my amplitude of my result is 5 over 5. So this is 1. And I subtract the phase of the denominator from the phase of the numerator. So 0 minus a negative 36.9 is a plus 36.9 degrees. So I of t is equal to 1 cosine of my frequency was 3 radians per second, 3t plus 36.9 degrees. That's in amperes. Finally, I want to determine the current I of t through the capacitor. Now, in order to do that, I'm going to take advantage of both of my previous steps that I did. Now, in the process of doing my equivalent impedance seen by the source, I did a stage in which the circuit was simplified to this stage. What I've done is combined the resistor and the inductor into an equivalent impedance of 3 plus J3 ohms. That is in parallel with the capacitor, which has an impedance of minus J3 ohms. Now in part B, I also determined the phasor form of the current being delivered by the source, which was 1 at an angle of 36.9 degrees amps. This now looks like a current divider in the frequency domain. In order to find this current, I can take the total current into the current divider, multiply it by the impedance in the other leg of the current divider, and divide it by the sum of the impedances of the two legs of the current divider. So, I, as a phasor, is this current, 1 at an angle of 36.9 degrees, times the impedance in the other leg, 3 plus J3, over the sum of the impedances in both legs of the current divider, 3 plus J3 minus J3. The J3s in the denominator, cancel out, so this is equal to 1 at an angle of 36.9 degrees times 3 plus J3 over 3. Now normally I say dividing complex numbers is best done in polar coordinates, but the denominator is not really a complex number here. So what I can do is divide 3 by 3 and divide J3 by 3 individually because this doesn't have an imaginary part. This becomes 1 at an angle of 36.9 degrees times 1 plus J times 1. 1 plus J1 has an amplitude of square root of 2. So its amplitude is 1 squared plus 1 squared. Take the square root. And the arctan of 1 over 1 is 45 degrees. So I is equal to 1 at an angle of 36.9 degrees times square root of 2 at an angle of 45 degrees. When I multiply complex numbers, I multiply the magnitudes and add the phases. So this becomes square root of 2 at an angle of 36.9 plus 45, which is 81.9 degrees. So the current as a function of time 
I of t is root 2 cosine, the frequency was 3 radians per second, so the frequency is still 3 plus 81.9 degrees. Okay, in this example, I'm given a circuit already in phasor form with the impedances of the different circuit elements given. So if I sub s is 10 at an angle of 20 degrees amps, I want to find the current phasors, I sub c through the capacitor and I sub r through the resistor, and specifically I'm going to dictate that I'm going to use nodal analysis to do that. So for this particular example, I'm going to set up my reference node exactly the way I would have done it before. So V sub R is 0, V sub R is now a phasor. Now I can identify my independent nodes. This is my only independent node. It is going to be V sub A as a phasor. Now, applying KCL at A. The current coming into this node is I sub s, which is 10 at an angle of 20 degrees. That added to I sub r, which is V sub a minus 0. So that is equal to V sub a minus 0 over this impedance, 50 ohms. Okay, so the same old stuff, Ohm's law, this voltage minus this voltage over this impedance is this current, plus I sub C, which is V sub A minus 0 over minus J 80 ohms. So 10 at an angle of 20 degrees is equal to V sub A times 1 over 50 plus J over 80 ohms. If I do the complex arithmetic, which I don't want to do right now, I get V sub A is 424 at an angle of minus 12 degrees. Now from V sub A, I can determine I sub R and I sub C, but I'll do that on the next slide. Okay, now. On our previous slide, we did our nodal analysis. We set up a reference voltage. V sub R is 0 volts. We solved for the only independent voltage in the system, which is the voltage up here at node A is 424 at an angle of minus 12 degrees in volts. Now we can find I sub R and I sub C directly from the voltage difference across those elements divided by the impedance. So I sub R as a phasor is V sub A minus 0, which is just 424 at an angle of minus 12 degrees over 50 ohms. So 50 ohms is a real number. It is 50 at an angle of 0 degrees. This is 424 divided by 50, which is 8.48 at an angle of minus 12 minus 0 is minus 12 degrees as a phasor. I sub C is also the voltage difference, which is 424 at an angle of minus 12 degrees minus 0, which is just 424 at an angle of minus 12 over minus J 80 ohms. So I sub C is equal to 424 at an angle of minus 12 degrees Minus J has a minus 90 degree phase angle. This has an amplitude of 80. So this is 80 at an angle of minus 90 degrees. So I sub C as a phasor is 424 over 80, which is 5.3. At an angle of minus 12 minus a minus 90 is minus 12 plus 90, which is 90 minus 12, which is 78 degrees. So now all we have, are, we have I sub R and I sub C as phasors, we can continue on and determine the time domain versions of these on the next slide. Now my problem statement said that I wanted to find I sub C as a function of time and I sub R as a function of time. So what are those? The answer is I don't know. 
the original circuit was given in terms of impedances. There are no frequencies associated with that at that stage. Likewise, the driving function, I sub s, was given as a phaser. There was no frequency information given to you. You don't know the frequency. Okay, so you can't find the time domain functions directly from the impedance domain circuit. You need to have some time domain information to start out with. Now a question that I can ask is what are I sub C of T and I sub R of T if the frequency of the input is 5,000 radians per second? Now that is a well-posed problem. So I sub C of T had an amplitude in the phasor domain of 5.3 amps cosine of now I have a frequency 5000 T plus the phase angle was 78 degrees in amps. I sub R of T. I sub R of T as a phaser had an amplitude of 8.48 and a phase angle of minus 12 degrees. So this is 8.48 cosine 5000 T minus 12 degrees in amps. Now I've been given the frequency domain information that I need in order to get to a time domain function. Now when I specified this problem earlier, I said I wanted to do nodal analysis to solve for I sub R and I sub C. There are other ways to do these problems, and in fact maybe the way I specified before isn't even the easiest way. If I look at this circuit a little bit more carefully, I'll see a current going into a parallel combination of two impedances. That looks like a current divider. So in order to find this current, I can use my current divider formula. This current is the total current times the other impedance over the sum of the two impedances. This current is the total impedance times the other impedance over the sum of the two impedances. So using current dividers, let's say, let's do I sub C first. I sub C as a phasor is the total current, 10 at an angle of 20 degrees, times the impedance in the other leg, which is 50 ohms, over the sum of the two impedances, which is 50 minus J80 ohms. Now I want to convert this to polar form to do this division, and 50 is a purely real number, so it's just at an angle of zero degrees, so this becomes 10 at an angle of 20 degrees, times 50 at an angle of zero degrees over, the amplitude of this is the square root of 50 squared plus 80 squared, and the phase angle is the arc tan of the imaginary part minus 80 over the real part, which is 50. So this becomes 10 at an angle of 20 degrees times 50 at an angle of 0 degrees over 94.34 at an angle of minus 58 degrees. So multiplying these two complex numbers, I multiply the amplitudes and add the phases. So I sub C is equal to 500 and an angle of 20 degrees over 94.34 at an angle of minus 58 degrees. 500 over 94.34 is 5.3 at an angle of 20 minus a minus 58 is 78 degrees. That's the same result that I got before. Conversion of this to the time domain would be the same as before. The process of solving for I sub R is essentially the same process, just with the two impedances swapped. I won't go through that. For my final example, I want to do a mesh analysis in the frequency domain. I want to use mesh analysis to determine the voltage across this resistor given this overall circuit. Now my circuit has already been transformed into the frequency domain. I'm given impedances. I'm given my forcing function in phasor form. So I don't know what frequency is associated with these signals. However, I don't care because I'm asked to determine a phasor. The phasor doesn't have the frequency information. I don't need it. 
Mesh analysis in the frequency domain proceeds the same way it did in the time domain for purely resistive networks. I want to look at this circuit, determine independent mesh loops, determine constrained mesh loops, and do KVL around my independent mesh loops. I have a current source. That's going to induce a constrained loop. I'll go ahead and draw it as being in this leftmost section of the circuit. Its magnitude and direction and phase angle have to agree with the current source, so this is 10 at an angle of 0 degrees. That leaves me with one mesh current. I'm going to define it as shown, and my single mesh current is going to be I as a phaser. Now I'll go ahead and do KVL around this loop starting down here. So KVL provides this impedance, which is 1 ohm, times the total mesh current going through this, which is I minus 10 at an angle of 0 degrees, plus the voltage difference across this, which is just the mesh currents times the impedance. So I times J4 ohms plus this voltage difference, which is the mesh current times its impedance, plus I as a phaser times 2 ohms. That all sums to 0. Now, taking 1 times I and 1 times negative 10, that doesn't change this. I can move my 10 at an angle of 0 to the other side. So 10 at an angle of 0 degrees is equal to I plus J4 times I plus 2I. So 10 at an angle of 0 degrees is grouping my I terms. I times 2 and 1 is 3 plus J4. So my current, my mesh current I, is equal to 10 at an angle of 0 degrees over 3 plus J4. Again, I'm going to be dividing two complex numbers. I'll typically do that in polar form if I convert this to polar form. The magnitude is the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared, which is square root of 25, which is 5. The angle is the arctan of the imaginary part 4 divided by the real part 3, so it's arctan of 4 thirds. This becomes 10 at an angle of 0 degrees over 5 at an angle of 53.13 degrees. So I is equal to 10 over 5, which is 2, at an angle of 0 minus 53.13, which is minus 53.13 degrees. Now that we've got the mesh current as a phaser, we can use our mesh currents to determine anything else about the circuit, including this voltage across this resistor. I'll go ahead to the next slide and take that final step. On the previous slide, we determined the single mesh current in this circuit. It was 2 amps at an angle of minus 53.1 degrees. Now we can use the mesh current and any, and any constrained currents to determine our other parameters. We want the voltage across this 2 ohm resistor. So the only current that goes through that is this mesh current. So this voltage is simply this mesh current times this impedance. So V is equal to the impedance 2 ohms times this mesh current, which is 2 at an angle of minus 53.1 degrees. 2 is 2 at an angle of 0 degrees. To multiply complex numbers, you multiply the magnitudes and add the phases. 2 times 2 is 4. 0 minus 53.1 is minus 53.1 degrees. This is in volts. That's the result that we were asked to get previously. This concludes lecture 27. In lecture 28, we're going to do a couple more examples of frequency domain analysis of circuits. Specifically, we'll start looking at multiple frequency components applied to a circuit, more than one source which have different frequencies associated with them. After we do that, we'll start taking a look at the response of the circuit as a function of frequency. It's called the frequency response. It's a very common way to characterize the behavior of a system by its frequency domain behavior rather than by its time domain behavior.